Okay, let's get started. Lecture 19. I think we are still, uh, maybe some students will be coming. So let's wait for another minute or so and then we can get started. Okay, people who are online, you can hear me, right? Okay. Okay, thank you, Connor. Hey, let's get started. Anyways, I'm recording the lecture, so people who are late can watch. Uh, today is the last lecture for reinforcement learning, and we will mostly be focusing on some of the applications, both in um, industry and research. So I'm looking, I'll be like going over some important research papers in the field. Uh, I know there are a couple of them that you should be reading as part of your discussion forum assignment. Uh, but in addition to that, there are like these different fields that I wanted to look at and like how reinforcement learning has been applied to all of those. And in particular, I'll begin looking at something that's known as OpenAI Gym. Uh, there is a link that's provided with this uh, OpenAI Gym. If you just go there, and let's actually go there together. So the moment like we open this, this is like a, a platform that helps developing and uh, comparing different reinforcement learning algorithms. And it's mostly focused on games. And it also supports like other uh, environments, but it's like it helps you uh, run uh, uh, reinforcement learning algorithms in gaming environments. Okay, so let's go and first check. So there are two tabs up here. We can quickly go and check the documentation of OpenAI Gym. And just to give you a background, this was a company that was founded. Uh, I think one of the founders was Elon Musk in. Um, this was basically with the aim that reinforcement learning, uh, both research and application should be more open in terms of like sharing and developing uh, like research in the area. And that's what this platform has done uh, until today. So let's go and look at the documentation first. So if you go to the documentation, it helps you with the installation and how to like build a new model, how to build like algorithms or deploy something new in like the existing environments. And there is this option of like creating your own environment as well. So I think because we are like still at the beginner level of like reinforcement learning, I would recommend that if we can build something in the give like with the given environments, we can do something with the given environments. That is sufficient for now, right? So this is how we uh, install. So just like any other, so Jim is the, the library that, that comes when you want to use open uh, AI, okay? So Jim is the library, you just like go and install like, like any other library in Python. And then uh, either you can go to the Git and directly clone it, or you can do a pip install Jim, and that's about it. So as simple as that. And okay, so here is an example, and I'm gonna show you like there are many environments that are available to us. One of the environment is the frozen lake example that we looked at last time, and I've tried to kind of implement it here in the lecture notes itself. Uh, I'm going to go over that as well. But here they are showing another example. And in fact, I've like closely followed their code that they've given here. So for example, all you have to do is just like once it's installed, you go and import Jim, and then you create your environment with the exact name of the environment that's provided on the Jim website, right? So what is that environment? If we go back to the environments tab, right? Here you can see a lot of like different tabs on the left. So there are algorithm based, uh, the Atari games, uh, box 2D, so two dimensional box, uh, robotics, and I think ours is toy text. Yeah, so this one. So I tr tried implementing this frozen lake. This is the, the e these are the easy environments. So I think like in terms of practice, and I know that uh, people are taking like the 4,000 level course, I don't have an, ass an assignment for you for reinforcement learning, but it would make sense if you can at least go and play with this like toy text, these easy ones. So at least to get a sense of like how you can uh, use reinforcement learning algorithms in this environment. And of course the environment is built for you. All you have to do is like different uh, configurations of like how the agent should be working, how the reward should be allocated and so on, right? 
So here is the frozen lake uh, example. And if I go here, let's say I go to frozen lake. Here it gives you like an entire description of like what the problem is, right? And if you remember last time we talked about it, it's like a grid walk where you have like these boxes that are frozen so the agent can walk over them. But there are these um, boxes that are uh, holes. So that means they're not frozen. And the, like if the agent steps on them, the game ends because they fall there. Okay. So one good thing about all these environments is that if you scroll down, uh, you will see a source on GitHub. And then you can go there and actually go and check the code. For some of them, like you'll see that sometimes the code is not available. And you, you might get a 404 error or for a few days because this is an ongoing process. So like people are continuously updating and uh, trying to like come up with new things. And so sometimes some of these are not available, but regardless, for example, this one, uh, is available. So if you just like go down into the code, you can see literally how like this environment has been written in Python. So if, if interested, you can like literally jump into that. So just like, again, I'm repeating, just go to this like view source on GitHub and it will take you to the source of that environment. For example, uh, let me go back to environment. Uh, the classic ones, this one is a nice one, mountain car V0. It's like a one dimensional track and like we want to build some kind of momentum so that this agent is able to reach this flag, right? And so what they do is they train this. Initially, like it's allocated some random speed and some like uh, random momentum. Eventually, like it does not receive a reward until it moves uh, like to the flag. And depending on how far away in every mo mo like movement it is from that actual flag, you receive a reward. So obviously the closer you start getting to the flag, the more reward you start to get, and so eventually it will start winning. Again, if you just scroll down view source on GitHub, you can like literally go and like uh, look at how this mountain car environment has been coded, and they have like some nice, I think, documentation as well available for most of them, as far as I can remember. Okay, so they do have like in the in the description section, it's a pretty precise description of what uh, what's happening here. But the, the important point is like all these uh, environments, for example, uh, let me go back to the, environment. the classic control ones and then the toy text ones are simple to, are easy to understand. So those are the ones that you should be exploring on GitHub and looking at the source code and how these environments have been built. Okay, so having said that, I wanted to quickly go over this uh, Atari games because these are the ones that are the most uh, like, exhaustively studied by the research community and as well as by the industry. So if you go down, so there are different like versions of like different types of games and some of them have like this RAM version and the same game sometimes has like a normal version which is like not RAM version. So basically what's like the fundamental difference and like I wanted to go over this breakout one because that's the most common one. You must have definitely seen this game the one that breaks the bricks up there by by move, by the movement of this whatever it's called the uh, disc that's moving on the bottom and basically you're supposed to break all of these bricks up there right and so there is this like breakout v0 like which is the normal version of this game and then there is this like ram version ram v0 so basically both of them are trained by using different types of input and this like RAM input actually refers to, uh, let's say, uh, so you remember the cycle of reinforcement learning where you have like the agent and the environment, right? And then there's a cyclic process. Now, when the environment gives back observations, the environment can give back observations in terms of the actual picture, right? Because that's how humans learn, right? We learn like, let's say I'm playing this game. I'm going to learn by looking at the, the, the game itself, the picture itself. But with computers, it's different. I can also give some form of, variable values, right? So maybe the coordinates of like this, um, the, the object that's moving, like whatever disk that is, or maybe like the the coordinates of the ball and the coordinates of like which, uh, which one I broke, right? And how, like what's the speed and all of that. So I can in some ways update some variables, right? So if that kind of an update is happening, then that's a RAM uh, version, right? And usually now RAM versions are harder to, like most people don't try to train over the RAM version because we are, like with reinforcement learning, we are trying to come as close to human learning as possible. And humans don't learn with 
those environment variables. Like if I'm playing a video game, I'm just like learning by looking at it, right? I know that this is what's happening and so that's why I lost. And so maybe next time I won't do the same thing, right? So that's the difference whenever you see the same game with like RAM and like the normal version. So let's go to this one, right? So here it describes what's going on in this environment. Observation is an RGB image, as I said. So like we are trying to learn through images. And this is a very hard problem. So we are going to go over that, how like high level uh, this fits into the description of the deep, uh, the DQN network that we saw last time is used to solve this problem. So we cannot just solve it uh, by a normal reinforcement learning um, uh, problem setup. So we use DQN. High level, we'll see how we use DQN for this one. Uh, but regardless, it gives you a high level description of like how the image is shaped and how it's stored and how each action, like uh, how the, the uh, observations are sampled from this like given uh, a uniform distribution of these values, right? So again, you can go and check the source on Git. So yeah, this is what I was talking about. For some of them, you will get this error some, for a few days because maybe some updates are happening or something like that, right? So if, if you're getting this thing, it's a bad thing, keep checking, come back and you'll see that like most likely it's updated. So you'll see that many times on this uh, website. Uh, but that's okay. So good that I clicked on this one. Uh, but anyways, going back to the lecture notes, now you know what OpenAI Gym is. It's uh, again, I'm repeating, it's a Python library created by OpenAI and it allows comparison of different algorithms. The thing is that it is providing us with some standardized environments, right? And so it's easy for us to tweak a few things and get the observations and the results. So if you like, a, it's a good starting point if you are new to reinforcement learning. And that's why I like to introduce this in the course. Okay, so here I have a quick example of like how we can implement this one. For example, here I'm just like using this uh, frozen lake example. So obviously you just like import gym. This wasn't even required. These two imports are not required. I just thought maybe uh, we need them, but we didn't. So that's fine, just import gym. And notice this thing here. So that's all basically what we do because the rest of the methods come from there. So I'm setting the environment by doing gym.make. And the only argument that I need to provide is the exact name of the game from the gym website. So for example, if I go back uh, to, I think this was this one, Frozen Lake, and I just like copy this name exactly and then just like put it here. That's it. And it is going to like be able to set up that environment and then you can use it, right? So for example, like my uh, recommendation is like that I have provided some code here for like a couple of iterations and like the game is running and you're getting some output. One quick like uh, practice would be that if you go back here and we go back to this page here, there is like, so I'm using the four by four grid. Frozen Lake is also there for an eight by eight grid. So try doing that, try using that. And then see like what happens. Now, if you remember in the frozen lake example, so here I'm, I have to reset the environment because I should start from the initial state, right? And then render meaning, it, you can see the grid at every point. So it's up to you when do you want to render it. So Fs are all the frozen uh, points in the grid. H is the hole, right? G is the goal. And the first where the red box is, is S is the starting point for the event. So that's how we described it, right? And then there are two different um, ways we can use this environment. Uh, of course, like you can inspect what is the action space, what is the observation space. We discussed this last time that you have like 16 observation space values and then you have uh, four discrete actions that are available. Like you can move uh, right, left, top, bottom. So all of that is there. And then you can create a dummy agent that plays the game randomly. Now you will see that uh, when I say up, it didn't really go up, it moved like right, right? So there is this like, um, I would say the, uh, like my, so I have created this dummy agent that's playing the game, but actually like this was the recommended value. Maybe the agent will follow the recommended value because I created that recommended value uh, somewhere down here. So for example, I created the winning sequence, but maybe the agent does not want to follow the winning sequence because there's a probability that it's going to follow or not. Remember our epsilon uh, algorithm. So you can like read the entire details of this going here. Uh, and yeah, so here it talks about like what's going on. Stochastic versus deterministic. So in the output cases, player actually moves in a different direction than the one chosen by the agent. And that's because like I can move anywhere, but the, the point is then 
I should be eventually able to learn how to, like what is the best path to learn? And that could be like exploration versus exploitation. Remember, and so that's why this is the epsilon policy that this is following. So again, this, this talks in detail about like why we are getting that. And if like, instead of 10 iterations, you do it for maybe more iterations, it's going to learn and then maybe follow or not follow the same path and still going to win, right? So checking this article uh, would be helpful for this one. But regardless, the OpenAI actual website has like all of this in detail. I just like got it from there. I didn't write any of this code myself. Okay, so this was a quick example of like, like how you can use this OpenAI uh, gym. Again, my recommendation is please check the Atari games uh, like um, environment. That's an excellent environment to go and learn how to implement uh, different reinforcement learning. And, and by the way, like everything is provided there. You don't do much. And there is another like very good library. I think I have a, a link to that here. So Keras RL, you can go here. Uh, why wouldn't let me? Okay, so if you go to this Keras uh, RL library, this is another library that's used for implementing like deep uh, uh, reinforcement learning algorithms. If you just like scroll down, this is this has like th these different um, game environments already implemented. So all you have to do is just like clone this uh, repo and like start working from there. So these are all resources that are available out there. In like if in case you're interested at all in working on any reinforcement learning type problem, right? So this is another very good library and like widely used library that's uh, available for reinforcement learning type um, problems, right? So I think I'll show you one of this today uh, with the multi... Okay, so the following algorithms have already been implemented. So they have they already have the source code for that. Uh, the DQN that we talked about, and then there are other ones. I don't think we discussed the rest of them, but we have definitely discussed this algorithm. So please go and check that at least. Okay, so going back to the DQN and the Atari games problem, right? So I said that there are two things that are happening here. Uh, if we go here and to the breakout problem, uh, not the RAM version, but this one, we said that we want our agent to learn this game by reading these images, right? And the moment like we talk about images, we we know that the, the best way to like process uh, images is through neural networks. And we know that through CNN, we can do that, right? So one of the like very well-known and uh, like widely cited paper, like this one, paper number two, uh, I don't know if I have a link here, actually did that. So the this paper, and this is like, uh, as I said, widely cited, this talks about this deep uh, QN, the DQN implemented for images. And so let me quickly show you what it does. And then we'll talk through like what's happening. So you can see it's a pretty complicated network. And if we think about this game, this Atari game, all that's happening is that this agent is like moving in like a, in, in a single dimension, right? Of course, like we have to take care of the speed and the direction. So there are like two variables. So the observation is just like two of these updates that, that are happening. But regardless, we want to learn from this entire image. So we will have to read the image, right? So all the pixels, remember what used to happen when we were modeling a CNN, like the entire image with all the pixels, it already became so complex. But here we just don't have to only, um, I would say keep like looking at the picture, but also keep track of the sequence of events that's happening, right? Because like if my uh, slider or whatever this is, is here, right? And then the next time it's here, like it's moving towards the left with some speed, right? So both the things have to be evident in my um, input if I'm using this image as an input. Plus the sequence of these images, so like the way like it reads these images is something like this. So let me like just quickly draw this DQ, the way this DQN works. Um, for example, I'm playing that game and my like my first image at time t looks something like this with my slider here, right? And the, the ball is somewhere here, right? So this is at t, right? And then I have another like t plus one, maybe my slider is here and the ball is somewhere here, right? And so on. Now this sequence of events that's happening is important. 
So I cannot just like use this, this first image as an input and just like feed to my neural network, right? So what I need to do is I need to like figure out that there is this like window of events that's important. And so maybe that entire window of events should be my input. Now this like this entire um, Atari game, like an entire episode that will happen until my agent wins is going to be a very long time. I don't know how long it will take to break all those bricks up there, right? So one way to think about it is like last time we discussed a replay buffer, if like you remember. So we had like, let me quickly remind you. So we have like some experience. Experience is defined by my state, my action, my reward. And again, like the next state. So if you remember, this was a tuple in like an MDP. This is how we define experience, right? So how should we, so the, the biggest problem with this DQ1 faces is how should we define this experience? and then that should go into my replay buffer. So of course, like my replay buffer uh, solved the issue of like a huge amount of data. Remember, so if whenever we had huge amount of data, we would just like feed it in and then this replay buffer would just build some kind of a buffer. And eventually when the buffer was full, it would like disregard like some of the earlier um, data points and then it will get the, the more recent ones, right? So the way we do that in DQN for images, and let me just write it down. So we're talking about DQN for, for images, is that I'm going to have a hyperparameter that's not going to be like my window size, right? So let's say I decided that my window size of this hyperparameter is three, right? And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create these small, uh, instances as like, so I'm going to take three instances as one experience. Right, so this is my one experience. And let's say I decided in my replay buffer that I'm going to take 10 uh, experiences in, like as the first sample. And remember this replay buffer is going to feed into my two neural networks. Uh, one was the Q network, and the other one was the target network. That 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 is not updated again and again. It, it gets updated after my Q network is trained for quite some time, right? So let's say I decided I, I need 10 experiences. So basically what's going on in this like replay buffer is that I'll have something like this. Let me again. Okay, so let's say this is my replay buffer. And I'll have like these windows of, of, of three, um, pictures that I'm like reading in coming in. And let's say my max is, is size three for this replay buffer. And then when a new experience comes in with another set of three, I'm going to pop this one out, right? This one, this one is going to go and these get shifted here and you have this one here, right? So this is how this replay buffer works. And then this is input to uh, like a more complicated uh, convolution neural network. So a CNN essentially. So this is how we are like able to use uh, CNN in order to train something like this. Like th this is a reinforcement learning algorithm in conjunction with a CNN, right? So given uh, obviously the key ideas are we have a visual input instead of like some state values, like what we were used to earlier. And the agent should be able to learn using those pictures. And obviously those, those pictures, especially if you look at the experience, it has like thousands of images stacked one after the other. And so the way we are trying to like utilize that is like in slabs of those like size, some size uh, windows, right? And this is very similar to how humans learn when playing a game because you play a game by looking at it and not like looking at some state variables, right? And so obviously it's very complex for computers to learn through, through images. And so that's why this is a more, um, I would say complex algorithm, right? And a few things to remember, for example, uh, sometimes uh, and in this paper, they talk about this, that you can simplify this input a little bit. For example, if you go back to the Tatari game example. Oh, no, it's here. Yeah. So let's say this game, if, if we don't have the color images, if we don't have this as RGB, and I have this as black and white. So do you think a human can still learn, like human can still learn and play this if it's black and white? Yes, right? Because I don't think color matters as much here, 
right? So what, what they decided to do is like, based on how humans learn, we can update our data because like humans don't need the color. All I'm doing is like breaking those boxes up there. And so I can make the computational um, cost down by taking instead like black and white images, right? And also if like the quality of the image is not that good, so just like imagine those a little, like not really bad, but to a certain extent, if I blur the pixels a little bit, like make them go down, humans can still learn because they can like still figure out some somewhat, right? Of course, I agree if the, the image quality is like that bad that like I'm not able to visualize anything, then it, it becomes impossible. So up to the extent where humans can learn and I can like downgrade the quality of my images, that should be done. So that's the fundamental idea. That should be done because we are trying to create an agent that learns similar to how humans would learn, right? So that's uh, that's what they do in this, like in this particular research, they try to um, simplify the input so that the computation is faster, uh, but not simplify as much as like uh, humans cannot like figure, right? Because that's the highest level, that's the optimal that they consider. So if we go to this paper, I think they have some good um, results. Uh, so this is like once you, you have this like entire DQN and then like the replay buffer and after that you have a fully can, like uh, a, a complete convolution neural network. And uh, some very good results. So this was, I think this is the actual results versus the predicted, uh, but like they, it eventually reaches to a good uh, like average action value. I wanted to show you, yeah, this one here. This one is a TSNE. So this is basically some kind of a clustering diagram that shows like how, and I think uh, it's a representation in like, in some ways what this is showing here is that this is like a complete um, blank. That's okay, this is not an Atari game example. This is like breaking these boxes here. So basically what they're trying to show here is that like these dark uh, dots are saying these are high reward regions. So both when like all of them, when they begin, just begin, they begin from a very, very high reward region. And when they're ending, they've like, they broke all those uh, boxes or whatever. They are like still in a very high uh, sort of reward region, right? Because the algorithm is able to figure out that I'm done and like I'm close to winning. And then when it starts, it's like almost the same. So some like really good results from this. Uh, if you're interested, you should definitely go and read this. There is another like really nice paper. I think we're gonna go over that uh, in a bit. Uh, but before that, let me quickly go over the multi-armed bandit problem because I know that you're going to like see that name a lot. And actually we've covered most of the concepts that are related to it, but I still wanted to mention this because sometimes uh, you might get confused that we never talked about this, right? So this problem is like a subset problem in reinforcement learning uh, with the exception that like, first of all, let's try to understand what this is. So this is like, you have a fixed set of resources that should be allocated between competing choices in a way that I want to maximize my uh, results or my gain. For example, imagine that like there's a gambler facing K slot machines. So that means that's a one armed bandit. And I need to figure out which one has the best payout and without losing too much money, right? So the fundamental difference between any other reinforcement learning problem and this one is that there are like, first of all, no episodes. So that means um, for, uh, like my current action is what I have, that's it. And my current action is not going to impact my next action, right? So let me quickly show you this, this uh, example and you will definitely understand what's going on. So the scenario is like a, a slot machine, right? So you have like these, let's say access to all these different slot machines and you're trying to figure out which one should you be playing with so that you maximize your uh, profits, right? Or your gain. So, okay, so this, this is just like showing you the gym environment and how you can implement it. I'm gonna skip that. Uh, it was a nice example. Yeah, so the biggest dilemma here is the exploration versus exploitation thing. So that's another important point because let's say I have like these five slots, slot machines and uh, let, let's say I, I played last time on those five slot machines and I know which one has the maximum outcome from my last experience. So maybe I'll just like keep exploiting that, right? Or do I want to explore more? And then given that like my current action, so let, let's say like whatever I select right now 
is not like going to impact what I'm going to do next. So basically, uh, let me show you this example here. So, and, and okay, so by, by the way, why is it known as multi arm bandit? Because it's more like you have these multi arms and you can pull any one of them to get the maximum value, right? So for example, let's suppose we pull the first five arms, right? And I get all these numeric gains, these values up here, right? So like, like I did, I did, I played for five slot machines and this is my gain. Okay. So the way we calculate the expected value is just the average of this, right? But the way we do that in order to better like, so, so the way this is reformulated in, under reinforcement learning is that this is how you compute your, um, I would say average function. So you take the average of the last um, n minus one uh, gains that you have, plus the exactly like the current reward minus the gain that was last time divided by the number of times you're like doing this. So just by looking at this equation, you can tell that as this n is going to increase, this difference is going to like diminish, right? So that's the, the whole, like whole idea. Whenever we want to update the value of an action, we take our previous expectation add the difference between this reward and the expected reward that we obtained and divide the number of times, right? So for example, here, this is 4.9916. And then we are going to do that again and again, right? And there are two variations of this problem. We know them. We already know the two variations. The one is the greedy agent. So the greedy agent will always select this, like it knows from the, the previous, um, like the previous values, it knows that this is the machine that it should be exploiting. So it's going to exploit again and again instead of exploring, right? But you can utilize the epsilon algorithm that we talked about earlier to do like to maintain a balance between randomly selecting a machine versus selecting the machine that you know is going to give you the maximum return, right? So there are two variations in this. I think article talks about that, the greedy, the greedy agent. And then if I scroll down a little bit, it talks about the epsilon algorithm that we discussed last time. Okay, this one doesn't have the epsilon, but I know that, yeah, the epsilon greedy agent. So whenever, like, that's the most basic implementation that like it greedily selects the one that has the maximum reward. Uh, but this strategy adds some randomness. So there's a good balance between exploration and exploitation. So epsilon will have a value from between zero and one, if you remember from last time. And then you can randomly select a new machine or you can keep selecting the one that, that gave you the maximum reward last time, right? Okay, so that's what a multi arm bandit problem is. There's a complete uh, like implementation available in TensorFlow for this one. And I provided the source for that as well. I'm sure like you, most of you wouldn't need it, uh, but still, if you're interested, like, like this is known as TF agents. So that's the library. And you can just like go and install it and then uh, utilize it for different types of problems. So this actually demonstrate a complete, demonstrates a complete implementation of a multi arm bandit problem. Okay. All right. Any questions, anything that you wanted to ask people who are online? Any questions? Okay. I know that's a lot of uh, information uh, dumped all at once. <laughs> But yeah, like once you go back and go through these resources, most likely you'll get like the understanding of what's going on here. Okay, so this, as I said, is the last lecture on reinforcement learning. And now I understand that there are a ton of advantages, especially for tasks like gaming, uh, for of the the uh, some of the examples that we talked about earlier. And the like the largest application of reinforcement learning has been in the, the area of gaming, like where the um, computer winning uh, these games and good, giving like really good performance. But there are certain disadvantages as well. And I try to list a few of them. And one of them is like too much reinforcement learning can lead to an overload of states that are difficult to track because everything depends on like, what is the observation you got from the environment? And based on that, there is some policy and you're taking an action, right? And so if there are too many states, let's say it's a more complex problem, because we just looked at very simple problems. So that was okay. But if the problem is like really complex, then you can have a lot of states and to manage them becomes hard. Okay, it is uh, usually preferable for solving simple problems for the very reason that we just saw that if the states become complex, then they're hard to like keep track of. One of the examples was like images. 
And of course, like we have um, uh, some very good examples of like image processing is possible with reinforcement learning along with reinforcement learning, uh, but it's usually preferable for solving simple problems as compared to complex ones, right? And the reason being it needs a lot of data and a lot of computation. Now, now this is not like reinforcement learning is known to be like data hungry in the sense that like, if you think about the frozen lakes example, right? I just ran it for like 10 iterations and it didn't win. It just like falls off in the hole every time I'm running it. So usually what happens with this frozen lake example, you, you, you have to run it like over hundred times before your agent wins. And that's the first time it gets the reward and eventually learns. So, and it's just, this is such a simple like uh, problem to solve if you think about it, right? So my, my algorithm needs a lot of data to really learn the path to learning. And moreover, we don't want to stop at just like one path and like my algorithm learned one path and I don't want to repeat that because I want to explore more. And so for that, I have to keep running my algorithm and keep letting it generate more data so that my, my algorithm can learn my policy updates are, are good, right? So that's why it needs a lot of data, a lot of computation. There is this curse of dimensionality that limits reinforcement learning for real like physical problems. That's another uh, issue. And then another thing is that in reinforcement learning, we mostly assume that everything is Markovian, right? So the memoryless property that we've been assuming. And so we are able to uh, like take good actions based on that, but real world is, is not Markovian. Now we have figured like in some ways, for example, in this uh, replay buffer type uh, setup, I'm able to keep track of like a few previous instances, right? But that's, that's not the, the core idea of reinforcement learning. Like I am treating everything as a Markov process. That means I'm, I'm in some ways assuming that my current state is not impacted by my previous state, right? So that's another uh, thing. And then the curse of real world examples, for example, for robots, right? The hardware is usually expensive. And then when you're training itself, it becomes like quite expensive given the hardware requirements sometimes. All right, so those, those are the topics I want to cover in like today's lecture for reinforcement learning. However, I wanted to go over a few important papers today. And I think these are important because they are from different fields where we can see not just in like gaming. And I think we focused a lot on gaming and like that's a, a good way of understanding reinforcement learning. Uh, but there are other fields as well where this has been used quite, quite extensively. And some of them are very recent papers. So you'll see, I'll, I'll begin with this one, paper three, that's known as Agent 57. And why I wanted to talk about this first is because we just talked about Atari games and it has been a very well studied problem in the research community. And believe it or not, it took like until 2020 to actually create an agent that could like uh, play and win all the Atari games that are there. So that's why it's known as Agent 57. If we go here, uh, I think this was in 2020. Yeah, it's, it was in 2020. So this uh, agent 57 is built on a reinforcement learning algorithm that outperforms the standard human benchmark on all 57 Atari games that we just saw here. So if we just go back environment uh, Atari, you'll see that there are like a lot of these games. So most likely there are like 57 of those. And with um, this like agent, it could like come to the human level performance for all of them. So. What exactly is human level performance? Well, humans are able to win all those games eventually. And so that's that's considered to be the benchmark. So that's the optimal value. Now, if you look at this like uh, red line up there, that's the human level performance, right? And these are like other algorithms that were built before this, uh, like Agent 57. And as far as I remember, this Agent 57 is nothing but like uh, an improvisation of this NGU algorithm with some uh, basic changes in it, right? So there is this NGU, this blue line is the NGU. So initially this, it was this blue line, but now it's this black line. And eventually like after certain number of frames, so number of games or algorithms are better than the human benchmark and that's what they're showing you. Eventually it does reach that human benchmark. So basically when it reaches that point, that means it's able to win all those 57 games. Okay, uh, as far as I remember the, the way they're, so they are using a, a, a neural network, as far as I remember. 
Yeah, so this actually is a good balance between exploration and exploitation. So it's allowing both. Uh, that means its agents are like, and, and there is a, a more, I think, systematic way of letting its agents explore new paths and not just like learn from uh, what they, they, they did last time, right? So there's a good mix of that. And I think there was something that I wanted to... Yeah, yeah, this one, adaptive exploration over a family of policies. So they are not just like focusing on one single policy. So remember in the, in the reinforcement learning closed loop form, uh, whenever my environment throws some observations to the agent, the agent takes some action based on some policy. Now, what they did was they have like a family of policies and not just like one policy. And that also adaptively changes with like which one based on a certain set of actions or like a distribution of actions and observations, sorry, based on certain distribution of observations. These are the distribution of actions that my uh, agent is going to take. So it wasn't just one policy, but by, like multiple policies combined together that the agent was taking. And then eventually it was able to like come up to the human level performance. So this is like quite a, a well-known paper, Agent 57, and uh, definitely worth a read. And this was, this is, I think, from the ICML. Yeah, ICML, which is, again, a very um, reputed conference in machine learning. Okay, so that's Agent 57. The first paper is a very good overview of, like, where reinforcement learning in what areas has reinforcement learning been being applied successfully because it doesn't quite like look that this reinforcement learning can be applied to anything apart from um, gaming right because there's this agent that you always think that is like some player or some 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 entity in a gaming type environment but then it, it ha like this one tells us about like all the success stories of reinforcement learning in different areas for example uh, recommender system, computer systems, energy, finance, healthcare, robotics, and transportation. Okay, so I'll quickly go to one of them. I think there is a, a way of, okay, let's quickly do that. Okay, so one like very interesting one was this like shortest path uh, example. So we are familiar with the shortest path uh, algorithm and uh, like there are certain known algorithms that uh, solve this problem, but this was reformulated as a reinforcement learning problem and then solved. And this was found to like give really good results with like, for example, reinforcement learning was able to work without even having like a lot of data about this graph, right? So it was like uh, a little different, a model free approach, but this is an interesting application where like there, there, there are these known algorithms that are solved by reinforcement learning. So that's one. And then the other one I think is the, Okay, so this slide gives us a high level idea of uh, where all the reinforcement learning, deep reinforcement learning has been applied. So in finance, mostly in pricing, trading, uh, portfolio optimization, risk management, and then in recommender systems and e-commerce, and we're gonna look, through, look over one important paper in that area. Uh, when we are like trying to recommend things to people on online platforms, I think this deep reinforcement learning has found really like good applications there and has like um, demonstrated some very good results in that area. And there was another very good one. I don't remember. Robotics is definitely there. I I don't want to go into that because robotics is something that uh, we haven't covered too much. And the way like we apply these algorithms to robotics is slightly uh, more complex. Uh, but yeah, this actually shows us like how uh, reinforcement learning has been in like almost every area of machine learning. Okay, so this and all right, so that's paper number one. And then the second paper is the one that I talked about, like the Atari games, right? We just saw this one here, uh, the neural network that was used to learn and like where, the, where in Atari games you were learning from the actual pictures, right? So that's that. And paper three is agent 57. Okay, so paper four is another uh, important application of like image processing using reinforcement learning. And here the authors propose this like pixel IRLs, which is 
a new like sort of setting for reinforcement learning and image processing. And th this is again like a, a combining reinforcement learning with convolution neural networks, right? And like the the applications here are like denoising, image restoration, uh, local color enhancement, and saliency-driven image uh, editing, meaning that they do some um, learning using this like reinforcement learning uh, approach at the pixel level of these images, right? And so that's what they're calling this as like pixel IRL. And I just wanted to add this paper here because this 1857 paper already talks about like one application of using images with DQNs. And this just like builds on that. This paper four actually talks about that. So again, this is a good uh, like worth a read at least. Okay, so paper five, uh, I think is the Deers frame. Okay, so this is this is the recommender systems application that I was talking about. So in recommender systems, there are certain um, okay, so there are certain known algorithms like the content-based filtering or the collaborative filtering, where you have this entire user item matrix, which is computationally sometimes like really challenging. right? Because like you need a lot of computation because you're trying to find similarity between users and you're trying to find similarity between users and items and then recommending some items to users. So in this one, uh, like the authors model this overall recommender system problem as a Markov decision process, right? And then they use reinforcement learning to learn the optimal strategies through some trial and error approach. So basically if like, uh, okay, let me just go to the paper itself. Yeah, so this recommendations with negative feedback via pairwise deep reinforcement learning. Okay, so if you think about the recommender systems algorithm, something let's say is, is uh, recommended to you, right? And the way you get, like the agent gets a reward is if the customer that's coming to your platform gave some positive feedback, meaning they either bought the product or they at least clicked on it, right? So when ads are being shown to you, let's say, but if you clicked on it or you bought it, and that's a reward for the platform. But if you think about like any platform, the rewards are pretty low. Like the positive feedback is low as compared to the negative feedback. Like I just keep scrolling through some website, but I hardly click on something or I hardly go in and, and buy something, right? So that's a huge problem. And that's the problem that this uh, particular paper tries to solve. So what they're saying here is that of course, when somebody clicks something and when they buy something, that's a reward for the platform right? But when they don't, right? Also model that negative as being a reward in some sense. So like uh, come up with different levels of rewards. And because like until now, recommender system was, uh, system research was not adopting this as much like the reinforcement learning approach, because it's hard to model this. Like you have more of like no reward instances as compared to a reward instance. So here they try to come up with an, an idea that create those as like dummy rewards or something, and then like go in and update your policy accordingly, right? So that's what like this means, uh, recommendations with negative feedback via pairwise deep learning. So again, like um, the, the over, like eventually the algorithm gives better results and they show that their performance is like better than the existing collaborative filtering algorithm. Uh, let me see. Yeah, so they redefine the de like so the definition of state and transition probabilities is redefined in this. So that's the bottom line. I would say that's the the key idea in this paper. That like why to just like think about state updates when you get a reward? Why don't you update the state when you don't get a reward also? Because maybe that's useful information. Maybe we don't want to recommend those things to the user, right? So in that sense. Okay, so that's the recommender systems area. And then another important uh, issue in like uh, platforms like um, social media or even plat e-commerce platforms is that of engagement of a new user. So imagine I'm a new user, let's say on Twitter, right? And Twitter does not have any information re like related to me. So how does like Twitter recommends things to me or like tweets or accounts or like anything to me? Because the platform does not know any information related to, to like this new user. So that problem is known as a cold start problem. 
it's a very difficult problem to solve and it's like still like there are different approaches for example one very like widely used approach is let's say i am on amazon and i'm a new user amazon doesn't know anything about me so they are going to recommend the most popular items that are like regardless that are there on the platform but that's that's one solution but that's not a good solution because you're just like getting the average in some ways it's like get the average and recommend that or just give that to the, the user so what they're doing in this paper is that they have like modeled this cold start problem as like the actor critic problem so we haven't talked about actor critic what actually happens is that that's another subset of like similar to the the multi armed bandit problem this actor critic is also like a, a reinforcement learning type problem so what happens is um there are two policies right there is the policy function and then there is sorry there are there is the policy function and the value function right we know that th those are there in my reinforcement learning problem so the policy function plays the role of the actor so it's going to like it picks what moves should i uh, like what moves should i play right and then the value function is the critic it tracks whether the agent is ahead or behind the course of the game so in that way it's able to balance like if i'm going away from my like rewards then my critic is going to track that and say that you haven't like the value that you're like getting out of this action is not good okay so why is it different from the other reinforcement learning problems that that's because in other like reinforcement learning problem formulations we either are focusing on the q value or like the policy or the value right here we are focusing both on policy and value okay so that's the actor just in case you come across this term actor critic we are actually talking about like this kind of a uh, reinforcement learning problem where i have the policy and the value update okay so that's what this paper does and it actually like i think paper 6 is something that you should definitely look into because it teaches you a lot of different aspects of reinforcement learning so they're using this like partially observable uh, mdp so in some say in some sense they propose like this actor critic reinforcement learning framework uh and, and what they say is that for every item i can propose this lifetime value into the recommendations every item has some lifetime value that i'm learning over like the entire platform right so again like in to just summarize i have that here uh and i think this part um the actor suggests a score based uh, policy which maximizes the future item value expectation and scores as are suggested by the actor are then combi combined with other like processes like the classical ranking scores in a dual rank framework of course you don't have to go into the details of this i've already highlighted what you should be like familiar with for example what is this actor critic framework that's something important and then what is this cold start problem right those are the things that i think you should like remember okay and then healthcare is something that has not adopted uh, too much of uh, reinforcement learning and so like here's this article that describes that like there is something that's known as dynamic treatment regimes where reinforcement learning can be applied and it's slowly being applied for example for patients that have long term conditions so coming up with policies of like their treatment what kind of treatment approach uh when they need like what drug dosage dosages appointment timings and so on right so that's like one application where reinforcement learning has been applied uh, but other than that like obviously healthcare is slow in adopting to uh, reinforcement learning as such right so that's like one example where you can use uh, reinforcement learning okay uh one okay so as i said like in the disadvantages and maybe i forgot to mention there is this like re, uh, like lack of reliability which is a, a known issue in reinforcement learning and this paper actually talks about like uh, i think this talks about like how can we measure whether this like this particular reinforcement learning algorithm is like uh, reliable or not and how reliable this is right so i just like skip this one uh, these two okay this one was developed by google so this is like a, known as a behavior suite for uh, reinforcement learning or bsu for short so this is a collection of some design experiments that investigate the capability of reinforcement learning agent with two different objectives right so like multiple uh, players 
like so we haven't talked about like multi agent reinforcement learning so it, this is in some ways that right so this was again published and this is a recent paper that was published by deepmind and it's like as i said uh, it talks about how can we like so it investigates and like gives some experimental results if there are like multiple agents in an environment so that's that's why i i just like put that out there but obviously we haven't talked about multi agent reinforcement learning environments so i wouldn't um, if you don't want to read that just like skip that one so that's not something and then finally robotics has seen like a surge of reinforcement learning usage and that's because like if you think about a robotic arm as such and it's like it's in some ways mimic, mi mimicking human behavior right and so that's why that's one like good application in real world of course like the issue is that the the like data collection in real world is uh, complex and it's more expensive and so here the authors propose a particular instantiation of a system using some like manipulation and investigated challenges that come up when you are trying to learn without instrumentation right because that's an, a known issue in reinforcement learning and specifically in robotics that's the uh, last paper that i wanted to go over and that kind of finishes our discussion of reinforcement learning uh, again this is a completely different to just to summarize it's a completely different paradigm of learning it's neither supervised nor unsupervised it's policy based and then there is this like closed loop approach where the agent is getting some reward as compared to like um, what we've been doing with supervised learning, right? So it's a completely different paradigm of learning. And it's really like um, in terms of research and development, it has been adopted a lot in a lot of industries. And also like the research is going on really uh, fast in this area. So if at all you're interested, I think you should definitely explore this. And yeah, that's all I have for reinforcement learning. I think I'll go back to unsupervised learning next week when we start talking about uh, Boltzmann machines. All right, any questions before we end? Okay, so yeah, that's, that's all I have for today. Uh, thank you so much for joining. I'll just stop this.